webinar series. Uh, today's session titled Utilize High Standards, Implementing ISO 14001 and Building a P2 Culture uh, will highlight the link between uh, pollution prevention and ISO 14001. Uh, as, as well as share some useful tips for implementing ISO at your facility. Uh, these series of lectures were developed uh, with an emphasis on the automotive industry, but could, could be applied at any, any facility that is, uh, is currently implementing ISO 14001 and, and looking for ways to reduce waste and, uh, and potentially uh, you know, save some money and achieve compliance with their environmental management system. Uh, my name is, is Michael Raspberry, and I'm the Associate Director of uh, UA Safe State Environmental Programs. UA Safe State is, uh, is part of the College of Continuing Studies at the University of Alabama, and our, uh, our program uh, consists of three uh, general areas. Uh, we have uh, uh, Occupational Health and Safety Program, uh, which is uh, the state OSHA uh, consultation program. Uh, that program can uh, offer free uh, health and occupational health and safety visits for small businesses in the state of Alabama. Uh, this is a free service offered to small businesses in the state, and they stay quite busy uh, going out and assessing uh, facilities. Uh, we also have a training and conferences group that uh, develop uh, uh, EHS uh, training opportunities, and this covers the gambit from uh, industrial stormwater management, uh, ISO 14001 uh, and uh, all manner of, uh, of occupational health and safety training. Uh, we have we are the OTI center, um, and uh, that's the you know uh, an OSHA training institute center where we actually train the trainers, and that's a uh, a, a pretty major program that, that we manage at Safe State. And then we also have the environmental program, and so. We actually work with facilities on environmental compliance. We have the ability to go to facilities and assess their environmental aspects and see if there are any gaps in their environmental management system. Um, we have an accreditation program uh, that accredits individuals in the state to do lead-based paint uh, and asbestos abatement projects. We have a field services group that uh, does industrial hygiene sampling. Uh, and we can do uh, all manner of uh, uh, environmental sampling, whether that's in the soil, air, or, or water uh, media. Uh, we also are the AHERA Compliance Monitoring Program for schools in the, in the state of Alabama, looking at asbestos in, uh, in schools. And finally, we're uh, this, the Pollution Prevention Program for the state of Alabama. And this is a, uh, an opportunity that is uh, partially funded by a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency. And our mission is to uh, assist uh, businesses in, in the state uh, find opportunities and uh, uh, areas where they can reduce waste and save money. And it's, this is a no cost obligation for uh, facilities that choose to participate in this program. Uh, we're about two years uh, into it right now. The, the, we can offer either technical assessments where we come to the facility and actually do a full review of how you're using water, uh, how you're using energy, and also uh, the types of chemicals that you're using at your facility. And we can offer recommendations uh, to uh, how, ways that you can better manage that, those types of resources and, and save money on your, your bottom line. The reports that we generate to you are uh, confidential uh, and uh, and uh, these are just areas where, uh, you know, you can uh, utilize those recommendations and, uh, sorry, had a phone ringing. Uh, you can uh, utilize those recommendations and, and find a way to, uh, to uh, better implement uh, your environmental management system at your, at your site. So uh, we are uh, very uh, happy to, uh, to host this webinar series and hope that uh, this information will be useful to you. Uh, we welcome those on the call who uh, are uh, uh, from the automotive industry and in particular those uh, from the Alabama Automotive Manufacturing Association, which are uh, uh, one of our uh, big uh, partnerships and we're hoping to uh, provide more of these training opportunities for free uh, with them. 
we do have a couple of little housekeeping items to cover. Uh, one, just to reduce background noise, all attendees have been muted and your cameras are disabled. However, we do have a chat feature, so please use that chat feature if you have any questions as we're uh, going through the, uh, the presentation. I'll make sure that I'm monitoring it. Uh, if we don't get to your question, we'll be sure to follow up with you afterwards and make sure that all questions get, get resolved. And uh, also just this webinar is being recorded today and we're gonna host it on our website. So uh, this will be available to you to uh, review afterwards and share with others. And so, you know, that's our hope is to just share this information and, uh, and we hope to amplify uh, pollution prevention activities in the, in the state of Alabama through uh, programs like this. And uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. Uh, she is a um, fellow UA Safe State colleague, Ms. Ashley Chambers. Uh, Ms. Chambers is the Environmental Services Manager at UA Safe State, and Ashley also uh, serves as the current board president for the Alabama Recycling Coalition. So if you have questions regarding the uh, recycling network and uh, waste management network in Alabama, uh, Ashley is a great resource. And so Ashley, now uh, you've already got your uh, screen shared and I'm just going to uh, turn it over to you and, uh, and let you uh, take it away. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, thank you to everyone listening live or watching the recorded replay. I'm Ashley Chambers. I'll be, I will be presenting during today's webinar session. And first of all, please forgive me and blame the pollen uh, for the, and the new growth on the trees for making me sound so nasal this morning. I'll keep my camera on, um, but like Michael reiterated and I'll, or said, and I'll reiterate, please utilize that chat feature. It makes this webinar so much more interactive for our team. And for you as the listener, we wanna make sure that we cover any questions or comments you have on today's presentation. And my goal with today's presentation is to present a practical introduction to utilizing high standards in the auto industry and how ISO 14001 implementing that framework really prioritizes and builds a culture based around pollution prevention. So this may be obvious to many of you, but if you have not been paying attention, the push for environmental excellence in the auto sector is a pretty big deal these days. And if it hasn't already happened at your facility, corporate and your internal leaders, they're gonna to start to put the pressure on all automotive facilities and tier one, tier two suppliers and haulers to conform to standards like an ISO 14001. And in fact, the 14001 standard was really embraced by the auto industry when it first rolled out in the 90s. And it, it was really, it was, like I said, embraced by the auto sector. And so auto, the auto manufacturing industry and ISO really go hand in hand, just like the 14001 standard and P2 go hand in hand. During our time together today, we're gonna to explore the maybe already obvious connection between P2 and ISO 14001, but we're gonna follow the plan, do, check, act, cyclical, Michael, uh, cyclical model, and show you how that can really assist your organization in prioritizing environmental excellence in meeting the intent of a standard like a 14001. We'll look at a few examples and see what success can look like when your facility begins to implement an ISO program and how prioritizing P2 just falls right in line with that. We'll wrap up with a discussion on how automotive suppliers and OEMs are closer than they think when it, when it comes down to making P2 strategies really work for them. So now just a brief introduction into ISO. And again, very, very brief. Um, for those of you familiar with the standard, it's pretty intense and it can get really long-winded, but just intro what it is. Um, it's the International Standard Organization. And in short, an ISO management system, it's the common language. And for a 14,001 standard, it's the common language of building a complete environmental management system. So again, if you're listening on this webinar and you have a vested interest in ISO 14,001, some of you may even be able to quote the standard clause by clause, especially if you're the EHS lead at your facility or have been involved in the ISO audit, either externally as a third party or internally, part of the internal audit team. Um, the ISO 14001 um, standard was last updated in 2015, 
So that's why you'll see 2015 when I'll reference it to, when I'm referencing it today. Um, there, there are rumors that another update will roll out soon, but we'll see. Um, nothing, nothing solid yet there. Um, but of course, uh, I'm sure they'll update it from time to time in the future. ISO provides the means for a third party certification and many companies do this by hiring consultants to put together their ISO plan and, and develop their EMS uh, for the company. And uh, an external company might even help track the effectiveness of the management system throughout the year. Um, but all in all, 14001 lends itself really well to the auto industry and manufacturers because it couples well with standards like 9001, which is quality management, and 45001, which is occupational safety and health, um, health and safety, and then the, the 50001, which is energy. The purpose of the 14001-2015 standard is to provide organizations with a comprehensive framework, like, like we talked about earlier, it's that common language that allows a company to prioritize the protection of the environment and to respond to changing environmental conditions and keeping all of that in balance with what's going on in the economy, what's expected from society. And it's it's the word of the, of the generation, I feel. It's, it's the focus on sustainability. So in other words, the takeaway here, ISO helps a company um, take a look at the processes and ask and answer the question of, how can we continue to successfully do what we do while making it known that we consider environmental excellence a priority and still create quality products for our end users and customers and stay out of trouble with the regulators? And ISO 14001 seems to be everywhere, doesn't it? At least sometimes it does. And that's really because many OEMs are now requiring their suppliers to be ISO certified. And that helps the OEMs achieve their environmental goals and initiatives. So if you represent or work with tier one and tier two suppliers, and you might be on the fence about implementing an ISO 14001 standard and getting certified for your company, just know that many OEMs are requiring it. So it won't hurt to begin that process to become ISO certified. A quote that I always like is, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's ultimately what P2 is. So the more we, the royal we here is the environmental leads for our companies or, or um, an integral leader in our company that, that helps to steer uh, the company's vision just in the right direction, the more we can work to prevent pollution at the source or eliminate that source altogether, the easier our company's job will be down the line. So P2, it's any practice that reduces, eliminates, and prevents pollution at the source. It's also called source reduction. So P2 focuses on clean and sustainable production and operations. And again, building that culture within an organization that supports a company's environmental goals. And ISO, the process of following the ISO clause by clause, it walks you through establishing those goals by identifying key processes and how those processes impact the environment, whether externally or internally. It also flips the script a bit and um, allows and, and uh, makes a, a company you, um, think about how the environment affects what's going on at the business. So there's a response plan as well. So the main categories that P2 usually focuses on includes air, water, waste, and energy. So we're talking air emissions, we're talking water usage, we're talking hazardous waste and solid waste and, and tracking materials either through a life cycle analysis or value stream mapping and, and really capturing the full supply chain there. P2 also looks at energy usage, whether that's efficiency or just reducing the load uh, that your facility is using at, at, uh, at any given time. So all of that really to say, um, that's the connection between ISO and P2. It's the development of a complete environmental management system and identifying what's at your facility and what's going on in the day-to-day -day operations and how those impact the environment. So we're gonna call those aspects and impacts here. This is where many facilities actually fail to meet the expectations and the true intent of their ISO 14001 is failing to, 
truly identify all of the aspects of the operation and determining how and what kind of impact those operations can have on the outside environment. So we talked about air earlier. We, we're, we, we're going to mention waste and water and energy. Um, so the ISO 14001 standard offers a process of looking at a company. So let's use an auto manufacturing facility, for example. There's chemical usage, there's material waste, there's air emissions potentially, there's oil storage tanks, and all of those things could impact water, water usage, air. Again, there's the, the impacts could be limitless, but ISO forces <laughs> you to um, identify all of those different things and ways that could impact the outside world. So it requires a company to look at everything they do. And like I said earlier, vice versa, it forces the company to look at what's happening outside and how that can affect operations inside. It looks at air pollution and emissions, like I said, water usage, potential pollution there, um, if, you're, if you're exceeding thresholds and limits. It looks at waste streams and how waste is managed, whether it's sent to an end of life facility like a landfill or a waste to energy, or if it's recovered as part of um, a, 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 a greening of the supply chain and reused within the process or finding a recycling um, component that can take that waste off site. Looks at energy efficiency and load reductions as well. And, and while we're on the topic of waste streams, I don't wanna discount the importance of examining the life cycle analysis of materials. And, and again, really the takeaway for all of this is what is your footprint? And with ISO, it's evaluating all the different ways that your company is impacting the environment and others, and how can you reduce that impact if you need to? So here's just a quick example of how looking at every at everyday operations, like a wastewater discharge here, for example, and identifying how something like a high metal load can impact the environment. ISO asks you to identify those environmental aspects, that's what's currently happening, and bring that into the impact. What's the result? Whenever we have a high metal count in our wastewater discharge, well, that can degrade the drinking water supply for our community. That can degrade the aquatic habitat. Um, obviously, there's regulatory impacts there if you're, if you're exceeding your, your limits um, with the state and local governments as well. So the process, this does take the longest in, in um, any ISO implementation is identifying all of the aspects and impacts. Here's just one, one example, uh, but we all know it, it can be limitless. So the, the goal is not to make your aspects list a thousand long, but to consolidate um, and make sure you're hitting those, those main media areas, the air, the water, the energy, the waste. And um, it can vary from facility to facility. Again, corporate is going to pass down some environmental policies as part of having an ISO 14001 and, and is required as having uh, with having an environmental management system. But making ISO work for your facility means identifying these very real aspects that happen day to day. Ending with um, when ending with this start too, um, after you've identified how you're impacting the environment, you need to set goals and you need to set measurable targets that you need to go back and revisit and measure and evaluate throughout the year, um, throughout the quarter, whatever you decide as part of your schedule uh, to ensure you're meeting those goals. So you're always constantly improving your company's environmental performance. So that leads really well <laughs> into the PDCA cycle or the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle. This is the process that ISO, all ISOs are based upon. This is where you, it walks you through clause by clause again, each, each section of, the, of an ISO standard ties back to whether you're planning how you're gonna implement all of this, when you actually are doing and implementing your operations and you're monitoring, you're improving, you're checking, and then you're constantly uh, seeking to um, improve your processes throughout the year or throughout your, your time allotted as part of each program. So by employing, by employing uh, this cycle on each process, again, each one of those aspects that you've identified earlier on, you can work on improvements of those processes for greater effectiveness. Because after all, environmental protection is the reason that you have an EMS 
or an environmental management system. So planning, just kicking it off there. Um, I like quotes. We used the, the ounce of prevention earlier. Um, but another quote that I really like here, it ties in really well to plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So when at your facility and working with your EHS team or HR or your stakeholders, you need to uh, plan an environmental management system that actually fits your processes. Again, this isn't a one and done uh, blanket sort of policy that you're creating here. You really want to um, uh, create your the framework of your ISO around what works for your facility. So most companies have that corporate EMS, but each facility should also have one. And so you don't want it to be too high level here um, in regards to it. this just meets the corporate needs, that's it. No, when you're planning how you're going to improve the environment at your facility, you need to bring in managers from marketing, operations folks, people from environmental health and safety, the engineering department, HR, to discuss training. Uh, you should be able to identify and, and make contact with and make sure, again, through identifying those aspects and environmental impacts, you need to be able to know all of the local, state, and federal regulatory obligations you have to meet. And planning involves goal setting. Like we talked about earlier with that wastewater example, you need to start laying the platform for environmental excellence here with your policy, and true goals. And not all of them have to be, you know, practical and achievable right now, but that's what you should be working towards. So get feedback from corporate here and get feedback from the folks on the ground at your facility to make your, your goal, make sure the goals aren't too easy, but also that they're not so pie in the sky they could never be achieved. But again, ultimately we're identifying and we're planning for success here. And within the ISO standard, this is clauses four, five, six, and seven. Um, so for those of you familiar with the clause, this is this is where you're you're actually building all of these documents. You're putting together um, the planning processes for how you're going to mitigate and reduce your environmental impact. The next step is do or implement. Uh, after reviewing your plan and building that environmental management system, you know, a lot of people when they're putting together an ISO, they actually put together a manual, an actual document that cites each clause. I recommend it actually, it helps. It really does help a, a company stay organized and with tracking and updating these different um, documents from time to time. But regardless, whether you have your environmental management system as an actual manual or a SharePoint document file uh, where everything's maybe organized or filed clause by clause. Identifying the environmental aspects and impacts of your facility coupled with getting that leadership buy-in again from, from lots of levels, lots of divisions within your facility. Um, it's time to get to work now and it's time to actually practice what you preach. So this is clause eight of an ISO 14001 2015 standard. This is where you use those stormwater pollution prevention plans. This is where you, you use, you cite, you reference, and you implement your spill prevention control and countermeasures plan. This is where you file your emergency response, your chemical inventory, your facility maps, your best management practices. This is also where you keep your internal and external communications filed. You document everything and you keep those uh, communication lines open between your employees and your interested parties. This is also where you train. This is where you identify, you set those internal responsibilities between the divisions to ensure that the right people are getting the right training. And we'll talk about training in a little bit, but um, environmental training is oftentimes sort of just a, a check mark um, on a new hire process, but it should be revisited throughout the year or throughout an employee's, depending on what they do, throughout their development. So ISO forces you to do that by this do um, category for the P, uh, PDCA model. Another another quote that I love. I'm I'm not you know I'm not going to just say quotes the entire time. But uh, the takeaway here for checking is you can't manage what you can't measure. So in other words, how can you know if everything that you're implementing is working if there's no monitoring or auditing or tracking throughout the year? So this is the part of the cycle where you're asking the questions, you're taking a look at it, you're, you're being really honest with yourself and your team and your processes and you say what's working, what's not, and how can we tell. Again, that ties back to whenever you were planning and you were setting those goals, checking is when 
you actually compare um, what's the result of, of after we implemented this process, are we actually on the path to or are we exceeding our goals or are we nowhere close and, and we need to we need to change things up a little bit. So it's really here about working with facilities across the lines to ensure that you know you're tracking nonconformities, you're tracking things that are not working and um, you're evaluating what is working. So similar to employee evaluations, you know, us in, in, in the, the leadership roles, every now and then you've got to sit down with an employee and talk about their goals and change those goals from time to time. This is where you do that. An improvement. This is what makes the most recent update of the ISO standard, the 2015 update, different from previous versions. It's this continual improvement drive to always improve, to evaluate the performance of your entire management system. Again, we've just checked it through auditing and through site walkthroughs. We're we, we see what's working, what's not. This is where you document um, the corrections you need to make. You document that corrections that you have made. And like any good cycle, it leaves you right back into planning again and creating those new goals if you need to update. So again, after all, environmental protection is the goal of this. It, it, this is a perfect model for ISO 14001, and um, it, it just never stops. It never stops. Sorry to break it to you. ISO does not stop. One thing about ISO that, that does leave people a little bit confused, um, and I'll say it this way, uh, you should not have an ISO document and a, or an ISO plan and a compliance plan. They should really be one. So again, using that cycle, the plan, do, check, act, by identifying the regulations you need to meet throughout the year or throughout the month or, or depending on which media in concern and, and especially in regards to P2, you will always stay in compliance if you have a well-run EMS program that identifies everything that needs to be identified and you're tracking and you're keeping those lines of communication open. Um, so again, if, if com environmental compliance is a problem that your facility has, ISO can provide the process to walk you through identifying how to improve your compliance. And again, why have two separate compliance document and ISO? Compliance is a part of ISO. So make sure not to forget that. So this is what ISO and, and P2 targets in particular, this is how sometimes they come across uh, whenever we're just reading, and I'm not gonna call it jargon, but when we're reading reports from corporate. Um, in regards to waste, you'll hear things like zero landfill. Uh, in regards to air, you'll hear things like zero emissions. Uh, we use less water. We're more energy efficient. We're moving towards clean, renewable energies. We've improved our supply chain by greening that through lean processes and tracking our value streams. And ultimately, again, going back to sustainability, it all ties in back to those P2 targets. So here's some, some examples of how you and the auto industry or really any facility can implement P2 and, and improve your waste processes and your air processes um, or your air impacts and your water impacts. So the first with waste reduction, uh, which is a common issue for any manufacturing facility, you have a material coming in, they're coming in from all over. Um, operations require lots of chemicals, lots of maintenance and, oper and um, processes there. Um, ISO and setting those P2 goals and those environmental targets, which is what P2 ultimately is, you can ask yourself the questions, what are ways that we can modify what we're currently doing to reduce this waste? Whatever it is, again, it may be materials. So maybe at the end of your process, you have a ton of scrap metal waste from uh, defective parts or reworked or just, just scrap, it happens. Maybe you have chemical waste. Maybe you have water waste. Um, maybe you're just trying to take a look at your fleet uh, that, that hauls your materials throughout the country. And again, for the auto sector, um, are you looking at uh, waste, waste fuel usage? The next one is finding sustainable alternatives, which is greening your process again. Usually this goes back to chemicals and looking for greener products that can reduce rinse time, um, wastewater chemical exceedances, but here, the takeaway for sustainable alternatives is all the while, you still need to be able to produce a high quality product 
So when utilizing and with setting your targets and your goals, just know that setting environmental goals does not mean sacrificing quality. Um, so always keep that in mind. And of course, of course you will, because at the end of the day, we all have a product to get out. Um, but by setting goals, again, that meet the targets of your pollution prevention um, plan and, and through ISO, that's where all of these come into play. So you can implement water, water and energy conservation practices, um, little things like efficient lighting, auto timers, motion sensors, and uh, fixing water leaks or installing submeters throughout your plant to know exactly where the most waste is happening and, and really honing in and pinpointing on those. That's how you set those goals, or these are ways you can work towards those goals. And then if you can't 100% eliminate, because again, pollution prevention, we want to reduce the source. We want source reduction. We want you know nothing going to the landfill, nothing being wasted. Um, properly reusing materials such as drums or pallets rather than disposing them as waste. Again, considering that life cycle analysis and thinking about moving towards more of a green approach uh, in regards to materials coming in. How are they leaving your facility? Are there opportunities to uh, repurpose those, reuse those, find another um, supplier, find another vendor who could, who could take those off your hands? And that's where the auto industry has moved in, in regards to the zero landfill or the zero net waste. So when you identify your environmental objectives, you set those P2 targets. ISO helps you pass that requirement down onto suppliers. Remember we discussed at the beginning how OEMs are now requiring a lot of their tier one and tier two suppliers to be ISO certified. So the OEM can stay, can stay in compliance and can stay in, 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 in meeting their environmental goals. So uh, I love office space and, and this is just never how you want to sound at company meetings. <laughs> but this is also why keeping the right people involved in your ISO plan, uh, making your, your ISO uh, implementation far reaching in the company, not just keeping that so high level that you sound like this, um, whenever you're reminding folks to do the right things with their waste, um, documenting the training that folks get. Your colleagues and your employees should know and understand the basics at least of uh, the importance of why we have an ISO program or why at least we care about our impacts on the environment. So again, tying everybody in together, greater involvement and commitment from top management and, and tying in all the other divisions as well to ensure that your policies, your objectives, and they're all compatible with the direction of, of the company and the organization, that it all truly makes sense for what your facilities end of the end of the day responsibilities fall into. So once you identify your P2 goals, um, implementing ISO, it helps you pass that requirement down onto vendors and other suppliers. Like we said, they don't always have to implement ISO but they need to understand why you want to reduce your impact and your negative environmental impact on air, on water, on waste, and on energy. And so what can they do to help you meet your goals? Implementing ISO and again, building that P2 culture internally and then externally shows that you're responsibly focusing um, on the future of your organization and that the environment is prioritized here. And understand too, as part of that cycle, plan, do, check, act. ISO and pollution prevention, it's not a one and done. Technologies are changing. Industries are changing. There's a lot of changes coming to the auto industry that we need to be ready for now. And if you're a supplier to the auto industry, what can you do to help your, your customer, whether that's the OEM or ultimately the end user, uh, the driver or the user of your product, how can, what, what changes can you make to your processes processes to help make the, the end product a uh, success. This really can't be overstated here. And ISO 14001, the 2015 standard, um, provides a framework for identifying interested parties. And yes, this is maybe 
helpful for those in marketing and PR. But at the end of the day, you need to be in open communication with your suppliers, with your stakeholders, with your board of directors, with your employees. They have to go home to their families at the end of the night. Are they uh, feeling that environmental awareness? Are they taking that P2 culture home with them? That improves employee morale. It gives them a different role. It gives us different spin on their day-to-day -day tasks that they take responsibility for because it's given to them. Are you staying in contact with unions and trade organizations? Uh, the auto industry has many, many, especially here in Alabama. What about your regulatory agencies? They should know that you have an ISO program. They should know that you are implementing pollution prevention strategies to help reduce your impact. I promise involving some of these interested parties, you know, at the least, maybe it results in a few less surprise audits from inspectors. Some of you may have very active community groups that um, enjoy using the stream that runs adjacent to your property. They need to know that you prioritize environmental excellence um, because who are they gonna look at anytime something goes wrong? And again, I'll, I mentioned it earlier, always remember someone's gonna use your product. You're handing your process off to someone else typically, whether that's the end user as the customer or if your customer is another uh, automotive manufacturer. And ISO forces you, again, it forces leadership and it forces really just within the framework of the document to clearly define the roles and responsibilities and prioritize applicable training for the right employees. So it provides an opportunity to provide environmental awareness across the board. And this can be done by assembling internal audit teams. Um, this can be done during your ISO internal audit. This can be done through facility walkthroughs, um, reviewing your environmental management system from time to time. Again, bringing in different parties will allow for a more complete environmental management system and a more complete ISO uh, program that's, again, evaluating everything that's going on there. Uh, if a process is changed on the floor and no one else hears about it in other divisions, it could be missed during a review. So there is that need um, to make everybody responsible from housekeeping to the board of directors, from transport to the folks working on the floor doing the assemblies. We talked about this. I think this will probably be covered in every single uh, pollution prevention training we ever do. Site walkthroughs are so important. They're a crucial part of seeing the effectiveness of your environmental management system, whether you have ISO or not. It provides that on the ground look at employee awareness and it helps your team identify gaps in the program. Again, identifying new aspects. If a process changed and, and you weren't told about all of it and if a new chemical came online and it wasn't fully communicated, you need to probably update your ISO uh, to make it match and to ensure that you're capturing and tracking and reporting all of those things and training on all of those things. So site inspections, they are required for a lot of those media and P2 categories that we discussed earlier, whether that's waste audits or stormwater pollution prevention plans. Um, you've got to do site walkthroughs anyways. So my goal for everybody on the call today is set a date, remove the rose-colored glasses when you go and do your facility walkthrough and actually take a live look at what's going on at your facility. Take pictures, interview employees. This isn't to get anybody in trouble, but it is to make you aware of what's really happening on the floor. You can't be everywhere at once. So put a team together and um, go take a look at your facility and see how it really looks day to day. Training and continued education. It's often overlooked, like I said earlier, and oftentimes it's just, uh, oh, we checked the box for this new employee. We just brought, it, brought them in and uh, we, we went over the environment and he's good forever. We all know, and as we've learned here today, implementing ISO at a facility, you've got to prioritize pollution prevention and set those environmental goals and targets. And to do that and to achieve those, you've got to have everybody on the same page. So are your employees aware of why environmental excellence matters and what their role is when it comes to that? Um, not everybody needs the same training. Do some people need RICRA training because they handle waste? Uh, do some people need HASCOM training because they need to know exactly what, what to do in an emergency response situation? What about spill prevention training? Do your employees know where all the spill kits are? Are the spill kits checked regularly? Are they um, 
have you inventoried the last time they were updated? Not all of those things um, stay fresh forever. So again, documenting this training, providing the training, and then documenting it. Um, that's required with an ISO. You've got to prove that you did what you said you're going to do with training, but actually taking a look at it again with that continuous improvement, whenever you're documenting training, uh, include the day and the time of the training, who was at the training, what was covered, who was the instructor, um, with the people who were there, how does this training apply to what they do day to day? Again, that, that allows you to take a look at what other kind of training do these folks need, or is this the right training for this team? And again, following up, Post-training, maybe schedule a facility walkthrough within two to three weeks to see if that training really sunk in, to see if changes have been made. Here's some great success stories and examples of how ISO and prioritizing P2 in the auto industry in particular um, works. So starting out, you know, reduction of energy and hazardous waste costs. Um, Moving on, uh, communicating achievements. Again, that's that's so important to keep your interested parties aware of your program and that your company prioritizes environmental excellence. It can help improve rollout time. Sometimes if you make, um, make great strides and achieve your environmental goals earlier, it frees up the opportunity for maybe another program to roll out. So it, the benefits far outweigh any negatives to prioritizing the environment and, and setting those sometimes not achievable goals. You'll surprise yourself. Employee morale and training, again, making everybody feel a part of the total overall commitment. So I, I had included this in most of my presentations now because I feel like the safety group, think about your safety group at, at your facility. They've done a great job over the years of really capturing that workplace culture that emphasizes, celebrates, and everybody understands the importance of the company's safety program and policies. And we should. We want everybody to leave work the same way they got there, safe and go home and, and, and come back the next day and, again, still put out a quality product while we're doing that safely. But why can't we do that same thing for environmental excellence? So the, the workplace culture and the environmental culture is more than just a policy posted on the break room or in the entrance lobby of a facility. Again, employees should understand why their day-to-day -day roles and why the little things that they do in their station, in their, in their office, and in their processes, how that ultimately feeds back into the companies or this facility's environmental goals set before us by us. So every person's responsible for making that commitment and, and adhering to that commitment. So we talked about training a little bit of, uh, before. A great way to really remind uh, employees about your environmental excellence is through toolbox talk. Uh, performing walkthroughs with the teams, bringing them on with you, giving them, again, that responsibility, uh, creating goals and incentive programs. Again, if you've set out a goal that, you know, is something achievable, like, hey, we want to reduce uh, office paper waste, that's something that's pretty achievable, and, and the return on investments usually, it doesn't take very long to actually uh, see success there, but if you, if you segment out different parts of your processes, you know, Maybe you get some company camaraderie and some healthy competition and incentive, incentive um, training and, and reward programs to help engage employees at all levels, to help build that culture of environmental excellence. So that was a very quick and dirty uh, overview of the ISO 14001 standard and how it connects to P2 and the benefits of truly tying those two together. Um, but moving forward today, what can you do now, right now, this quarter, this year, to make those improvements, whether you have an ISO standard or not? Are there some pollution prevention categories that we covered, air, water, waste, energy, that you could plan goals and work towards achieving them. Uh, sometimes this can look like just doing a utility bill review and taking a look at actually your power bills and your, your surcharges from the wastewater plant you might discharge to, uh, chemical usage, taking a look at, at your true inventory there at your facility. Um, sometimes it's just a facility assessment and kind of evaluating, oh, we might need some training here. Our, our folks are just not capturing onto this. 
uh, this can this can be overwhelming for a lot because like like many companies, sometimes the environmental team is the smallest team. And even if it's a large team, not everybody can be everywhere at once. So the overwhelming part doesn't have to be overwhelming. And as Michael mentioned earlier, this is where getting a free P2 facility assessment and recommendations report really comes in. And, and he mentioned it, I'll mention it again. This is a no cost and confidential report program. Everything we generate just is sent to you. It's not shared with a regulator. It's not shared with anybody else. It's yours and yours alone to decide on if the recommendations made throughout our facility assessment and maybe document review um, warrants you changing your environmental goals a little bit and, and maybe helping us create a case study to show success and how implementing P2 strategies can help improve processes at your facilities. And like Michael said earlier, we are definitely focusing on environmental manufacturers and tier one, tier two suppliers. However, we work with everybody. Uh, that's just what we focused on with this particular grant cycle, but we welcome the opportunity to meet more of you, to get out in the field and to help you achieve the goals that you've set at your facility. And if you haven't set goals, we can all sit down together and talk about what's truly happening on the ground. So again, those, those we can provide technical assistance in regards to your P2. Technical assistance can also help um, with your ISO program. And again, personalized training for your facility. Um, you know, today it was a very broad training for the automotive sector and tier one, tier two suppliers, but we'd love to work with you and put on a similar training like this to discuss exactly what happens at your facility and personalize that training for you under this grant opportunity. That's possible. So, Michael, I'm going to stop talking for a second and open it up. Did any questions come in? Is there anything I, I missed that you'd also like to discuss? Well, that was great, Ashley. Thank you for all that information. Uh, and, you know, as you had stated, uh, you know, we're currently uh, seeking uh, partners in the automotive industry. However, you know, we our previous uh, grant agreement was with food and beverage manufacturers. And we still welcome uh, those in any, in any industry sector uh, that needs assistance and uh, whether that's just assistance with looking at some of those utility bill reviews that, that we're here for, for them as well uh, was a good point. And so, uh, yeah, we did, uh, I, we've got time, I believe, for, uh, for one or two questions. Uh, one was just, do you have any recommendations for tools to assist with evaluating an EMS? Are there any tools? Uh -huh that you can, uh, can uh, consider? Yeah, absolutely. Um, don't you love Google <laughs> and free software? Uh, Michael can share more information about this as well, but we've used a, a tool, it's free, it's called the Jimmy tool when we've evaluated a, a facility's ISO program. And what that tool, it's set up in a, a macro Excel sheet and it, it creates a dashboard and it separates out the different components of ISO. And so as you're working through an, I, uh, an EMS, an environmental management system, and the document and the document review, you're able to honestly give yourself a score throughout that, uh, that tool. And at the end, it gives you a grade and it shows um, different areas that you need to improve. And through those grades, you can help prioritize, hey, this is a significant issue. This is a minor thing. This is an opportunity for improvement here. Or, hey, we're perfect, which no one's ever perfect. Uh, but yeah, I would recommend the Jimmy tool. Uh, anything else you can think of, Michael, there? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, and by Jimmy, it's G-E-M-I. And so they're the Global Environmental Management Initiative. And we could share a link to their, their site, but they are a, uh, uh, a membership group and uh, they develop a number of tools on sustainability and so forth. But that, that tool is just has a standard sort of checklist that uh, individuals can look at as they're evaluating each clause of the ISO standard and whether or not they're in compliance with those. And so it's, it's kind of a standard sort of checklist format, but something that is valuable to go through where you can kind of, uh, like, like you said, give yourself a, a grade and, uh, and, and kind of see overall where you do have room for improvement, which that's the ultimate goal for the, for the ISO programs. That's right. Well, uh, with that, uh, I really uh, would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. We hope it was useful. Uh, it is being recorded, has been recorded, and will be posted. 
uh, at our uh, website, uh, and uh, we will uh, share that web address with you. And it's also uh, you know, going to be posted on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and so please feel free to share this with others that, that you know uh, may be uh, interested in it. And, uh, and there's uh, Ashley had provided some contact information. And so if you or if you know of anybody that might be interested in uh, contacting our program and, uh, and letting us come in and kind of assist to uh, look for some opportunities for improvement and ways that you can save money, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, this uh, Accelerating Toward P2 webinar series continues next week uh, with uh, source reduction activities and how uh, that can help to reduce chemical emissions at your uh, facility. And so that's going to be a, a very nice talk that will be uh, given by Callan Tu, who is uh, uh, also a, a member of the UA Safe State team. And then the following week, uh, April 22nd, we're going to have uh, Dr. David McPhee from the Industrial Assessment Center is going to give a presentation on uh, energy efficiency and compressed air best practices. So please uh, join us for those. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to uh, let you have uh, your break and let you go have your lunch. And we look forward to uh, communicating with you next time. Have a good day.